Maxine. Um, Simon. Welcome to the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic. It's a delight to be here. Thank you, thank you very much. We're very, very honoured. And um, it's been a fantastic weekend. And I've got a little list of questions for you. But first of all, I wanted to mention something that Cecil used to talk about in the way in which he described the museum as a web to gather in knowledge. And um, I find that we're the latest flies in that, in that web today, because I hope during the course of this interview we'll be um, sharing knowledge, which is the main thing, which was Cecil's aim for setting up the museum. And what was the fly? We are. Oh, oh, I see. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the latest ones. Um, but seeing as we've got, there's quite a few magical objects that belong to Alex that you would have had an association with. Um, I wondered whether you could tell us about this piece. <coughs> it's a mask that we have on display in the museum. And um, I wondered if you had any stories associated with it. It was made for Alex. Um, we were filming and working with Black Widow. And he had to take the part of the magician, and I was the demon. But it was it was more fierce when, when it was simple. He obviously added this on later, oh. and the feathers the feathers were rather gorgeous. Mm. There's, it's the picture of it is on uh, the first edition of What Witches Do. Right. And oh yes. Yes, and I'm in the long robes, and Alex is in this, and this I can't remember. This was silver. Mm. And that was red. Oh, so it's been repainted? Yes, Alex did it. Uh, oh, he got somebody to do it. And I think it, it's lost its energy. It looks, mm. looks particularly menacing now. Mm. But before it, it was still menacing, but it was cleaner menacing. Right. And this, right. I think it was built, made for the magician, not for the witch. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was more of a prop for that? Yes. But did you then go on to use it in Richard's um, I think or? Alex did, I don't know. Yeah. He, he never did when he was in uh, London. He might have done it when Bet's Hill. Okay. No, it's, it's particularly, lots of people comment on he it. He did work yes. with um, the Aztecs. That was, his, that was his main interest. He was mm -hmm. quite obsessed with it and very much into maths. Yeah. But in the, 50, in the 60s and 70s, whenever he p appeared on television, he'd wear very dark glasses. Right. right. And when challenged on it, he would say, it's uh, to protect you from me. Oh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I didn't think it was fantastic. I thought it was a bit cocky. It was a bit cocky. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that back. Um, so, um, looking back, just for those who might not know, I think interested just to ask how you first met Alex and what your first impressions were of him. My mother knew him before I was born. They were great friends. They worked in the same place. My mother was a company nurse mm -hmm. and Alex spent more time chatting to my mother than he did on the floor, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And um, they were great friends. But after I was born, he used to babysit mm -hmm. and my father hated this man and called him a something pansy, right. and so they separate, the ways went separate. Mm. And then my mother was involved with um, Gurdjieff and Subud, and she was making inquiries about Subud and had to meet in the Seven Circles Cafe in Manchester, mm. and there was Alex. Oh, okay. And that was what brought him back in. And when she told me that she'd invited Alex to tea, and that he was a witch, I was furious. I found the church, Father George, and he said, well, what can you do with a Catholic that reads the news of the world and then invites witches for tea? There's no stopping them. They will have their way. And he was quite right. Yeah. And so Alex became a regular visitor. And no, I didn't like him when I first saw him. I thought he looked bald and bandy. And later I discovered that he indeed was toothless. Right. So, oh, really? Mm, oh, okay. He had them all out when he was 26 because he broke the front one. Mm. And he was so vain, he said, take them all out. The whole mm. oh, He was quite open about it, he told mm. anybody. Mm -hmm. He was aware of his vanity. He was, a, he was both a humble man, the generous to a fault, and he was the ruthless magician. Mm. 
So, and I was once asked, um, what was he? Was, a, was he a, a magician, truly? And uh, what was he? And I said, well, he is or was the magician and the fool. Mm. Yeah, the two are closely linked in, in lots of parables. Yeah. But the, I mean this, without mm. the parables, mm. it was a fact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, during the 60s and 70s, um, Alex never held back from sort of courting publicity. And you say that. Well, there was, there's a lot of press. We've got there a is press. a tremendous amount of press. But he didn't court it right. until he left London, mm -hmm. which was late 72, 73. Mm -hmm. He was a magnet for the press. The phone never stopped. He didn't approach anybody right. Uh, right. in the media. He loved it. Mm -hmm. And the moment they phoned, you know, it, it uh, opened the front door immediately. Yeah. Loved it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was almost destiny that his character was needed to speak with the press. Yeah. To be Not, a spokesperson almost. Mm, well, in retrospect, I don't know whether it was right. I'm veering mm. more and more now to the secrets and the sacredness and mm. to keep the crafts sacredness. So, but it's done now. Yeah. Do, do you think, how much of it was to do with his, his need for, for sort of recognition and how much was it to do with um, ensuring the survival of the craft? Did he see it that way by publicising it? He was an acute clairvoyant. Hmm. I think he was a man of the moment, but he did, um, he enjoyed the publicity. He was clairvoyant enough to know that in the future this sort of thing would be happening. Mm. And he also knew that he was the one that opened the door to it. Yeah. Um, whether, whether it was about his own ego, I think, yes, he made, to do that kind of work, there had to be. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But to, you I, have to be an extrovert. I, I think his, uh, and this is often, or not spoken about, was his absolute love of the craft. Mm. I mean, he'd curse it. He'd curse the goddess regularly. Yeah. She was a bit like the Italians. If it didn't rain, he'd, you know, he'd be drowning the statue. Mm. Um, but his love was unquestionable. Mm. I think that comes across, from, from my opinion, anyway, from all mm. I've covered. Um, was there a reason why the sort of underground press, the magazines like Oz and and this didn't pick up on it in a way, because I haven't seen any interviews done with Alex within those sort of underground journals that existed. There were, there were some, what was it, Time Out? Uh, no, Not that wasn't it yet. Yeah. Well, that was a big thing. That went on for yeah. a whole year with Alex writing back, with backwards and forwards, these two magicians. Mm -hmm. And everybody was, you know, couldn't wait for the next letter. Right. So maybe they'd got better things to do, the others, right. but... Yeah, yeah. And how did Man, Myth and Magic come about, the connection? A phone call, as usual. A phone call, mm. yeah. a phone call. I forget the, the names of the people, uh, but he was uh, on the TV when they were pre just bringing it out. Oh, okay. Obviously. He was part of the original yeah. uh, presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so talking about those times too, how did the relationship with Black Widow, the rock band, come about? Another phone call. Right. <laughs> we got a phone call in the afternoon. Um, Black Widow had a stage act mm. that went with their record, and basically it was a magician in a circle bringing back the goddess that he loved from a previous life, right. unaware that during that t time the gods of the old had become the devils of the new. Right. And so what he did ha happened, he'd invoked Ashroth. Mm. And Ashroth was in the form of, very of a very beautiful priestess. He was in his circle and he made the mistake and broke the circle. And so the demon came in and you see this almighty battle. Mm. And it was um, when Alex and I did it at one, one point. I'd, I did it with Black Widow because every girl that they had got in to play the part either had a nervous breakdown or became psychotic or something. So the phone call went, there's something that we need somebody to do this. Alex said, oh, Nikki will do that for you. And Nikki backed out at the last minute. 
And without any rehearsal, I did it. You were thrown into the... I'm quite, well, yes, I was very frightened, but I, I, once I got the hang of this demonic stuff, I quite enjoyed it, you know, right. it allowed something out. Mm. And especially when it came to the point of Alex being the magician and not the band singer. Mm. Um, and then we had a battle royal and um, they covered me with glue mm. to put the sprinkle on, you know, to give me that... A gl thing, glitter, you know. yeah. Now Alex threw the sensor at me. This is on stage, two firemen, to the mm. side, and I asked, they set me on fire. And I could see him thinking, don't you dare come on this to the really? firemen. Mm. And anyway, it was all right, and I wasn't scarred. Yeah. The glue was a bit difficult to get off, but mm. we took it quite seriously when we did anything publicly. And mm. I know mean, it's a few people know that when there were photographs taken of so-called rituals, they weren't, they were all posed. Right. Of course they were all posed. Yeah. We're not going to put our sacred craft truly in front of the cameras. Mm. But we, need, we know the best angle, etc. Yeah. Um, and Alex really did, it, he wouldn't have, there'd been pictures of some witches previously, and he said, my witches are not going to look like that. You have to be good. You're Ale well, he didn't say Alexandrian then, but it was, these are my witches. Mm. And a lot of people, you see them photographed today, and they'll go out working outside, and they've got um, big boots on. Thermals. And, and the jeans, mm. the robe's not long enough to cover them, and they look like pagans, right. not yeah. witches. You know, witches can be robed or naked. Um, but coming from the robes, the naked is one single thing. It's not taking layer, layer. No. We want to be at one with the natural elements. Mm. We're not hikers. No. <laughs> He would sit up the night before on his treadle sewing machine, mm -hmm. making as many as 12, 13 robes. So he was adept at, at making the, the, the robes too? Oh, well. so he was a great crochet. Um, oh, crochet? Mm -hmm. oh, well. He once, um, we'd done a film called Legend of the Witches and um, Malcolm Lee invited us to the after party. Mm -hmm. And I wore this purple crochet dress, and it was uh, a mini. And I was drinking, and people kept pouring me the wine. And I was dancing a lot. And I thought, I'm getting a lot of attention here. And my skirt was getting shorter and shorter. One of the, the threads that, yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> caused quite a stir. And, and, mm. Where did it end up? I oh, no, 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 you shouldn't. No. Um, but uh, I was kept my dignity. The, you mentioned Alexandrian, actually, the, the, the term. How did that come about? Wasn't Stuart Farrow involved? Well, Stuart, Stuart Farrow, uh, Farrow he, um, people were calling mm. Alexandrians Alexandrians. Yeah. It, it, that, that had happened. But when it came to the book, Stuart wanted to know there was a, just a very brief conversation. OK, what title are we going to settle on? Mm. Or words to that effect. And then he said, Alexandrian? And Alex and I looked at one another and said, hmm. yeah. you know, it's already out there. So, mm. But he put the seal on it. Right. right. Now I've always wondered about how that came about. Um, and it wasn't after the library. Oh, it wasn't? Because I've read somewhere that it could have been. No, the no. They the get library. confused. These people, they assume these things happened. It was my fault. I named my daughter Maya Alexandria. Hmm. And while we were in the registry office, uh, Alex said, are you sure you don't want Alexandra? I said, no, I want Alexandria after the library. Hmm. And it's proved, proven to be a good thing. I have yeah. a highly intelligent daughter who is forever with a nose in a book. So, yeah. anyway. Fantastic. Yeah. You mentioned um, being sky cloud in, in rituals. I read this story a long time ago about something in Audley Edge where Alex invited a journalist to witness him raising the dead. Oh, yeah. Can you tell I wasn't me about on that the story? scene. I wasn't on the scene, but yeah. I know the story. Yeah. He, one of the covens Alex uh, belonged to was a coven in Poynton just outside of Manchester. Mm. And they were sort of middle class people, and uh, it was a big coven. Lots of them were teachers. They were professionals. 
And somehow the press had got an angle on this, that in actual fact the local Christians were indeed witches mm. and were planning a big expose. And Alex said, you know, he went to the press, he said, I'll give you a bigger, better story. And so they accepted it. Went to Old Liege, got all these strange, his friends, who weren't anything to do with the craft, and, and a dead body that was all bandaged up and mummified. Where was the dead body from? I'm coming to oh, the... Sorry, you sorry, don't sorry, spoil my line, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, he, um, it was laid across one of the stones at Old Liege. And a lot of mumbo jumbo went on, and the final bit of the mumbo jumbo was a Swiss roll recipe spoken backwards. Right. At which point, the dead body started to move mm. and come to life. You've got to remember this is in the 1960s, and there yeah. was a very now we'd all go, oh, go on, you know. Yeah. But it it frightened them away. Mm. They ran. I can imagine. Mm. Yeah. They ran. I think they did do a small um, write up on it. Right. But it, they were too frightened to really go into it. Mm -hmm. But there you go. It's amazing what a work the Swiss res roll recipe will give you. <laughs> Spoken backwards. Because mm. um, you, you worked at Audley Edge quite a lot. Mm. Was there a reason for that, or was it just close by? or? Um, it's a very, very beautiful place. Mm. It has a high altar natural high altar and it has um, you can walk under it and it's called the devil's cave below and if you run around it three times it's supposed to get your virginity back um it's worth knowing pardon it's worth knowing oh yes <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah so why um, was it it was a magical place it has mm. a stone circle there people think it was to do with the witches it wasn't it was the people who worked in the caves below mm -hmm. who'd set these stones to sit down and have the dinner mm -hmm. you know and the sandwiches and the lights fire in the middle so it was a perfect opportunity for us to it is a magical and, place I yes mean, work there yeah. and Alex had always worked there it always mm -hmm. you know from childhood it had been one of his places that they would go to mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a sort of not a black pool it was a very sophisticated day out in the country right. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you've witnessed so many changes in the craft over the years. What do you think have been the, for the better and for the worse, in your opinion? You know, I can't answer that. I know for a fact that there are some wonderful witches. The majority, indeed, are mm. wonderful, and they get on with the work. And they're very devout, uh, full of fun. It's no good being all holy and no laughing. Mm. And... Um, they are really wonderful. And then you get the other ones that are competing to be the best coven and they want people to come. They're advertising the craft, mm. which is we're never ones to seek converts. But now it's happening. Yeah. And I always say, well, people make a crowd. They don't make a coven. Mm. And I find uh, the simplicity of the rituals, the basic rituals of the craft, have been added to ad nauseum mm. and when you come to work them you find or I find uh, that it's empty ritual a lot mm. of empty ritual I think there's a lot of play acting planting seeds in a plant pot in the circle as if we don't know how seeds grow into flowers you know mm. we recognize the nature of it but it's here it's outside yeah. it's out with it so it it has got the side to it that I don't like. Mm. But in the main, I think it's pretty wonderful. Yeah. And I think the changes that have come about, the witches are now more able to help the general community because mm. some of them are known. Mm. And they, they can be approached without the fear of being judged or, or charged. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's another thing. There's a lot of money goes on in in today's craft, people do charge money. And I think the majority of times this is very wrong. Mm. Even though they say the labour is worthy of his hire, uh, 
if they're asked to pay anything more than the cost of the candles and the incense and the actual stuff to make it, then I think this is wrong. Mm. Mm. There's a story there about Madeleine Montalban. Oh, uh, she found another phone call, she found out, she said, Maxine, we haven't met, even though I did correspond with your husband at one time. Um, but I need some witch magic. Will you come over? And I said, well, I have to bring somebody with me, because I didn't know this woman. Anyway, we got there and I leaned on things. She was, had a thing about Richard III, these wonderful old oil paintings covered with what she called gems of the earth, you know, coloured glass and so on. In the early uh, part of the evening, she suddenly decided we were going to go out for dinner and she drank copious amounts of wine. I blame her really to make me, you know, she made me an appreciator of wine. Mm. It's all Madeline's fault. Um, <laughs> but she was telling me about this lady that had been to visit her called Sai. And this lady had visited me as well after she'd been to Madeline. And I said, well, what happened with you and Sai? She and Sai had gone and said she was heartbroken, her boyfriend had left, and that she, she'd do absolutely anything to get him back. And Madeline said, um, OK, you can have him back. That'll cost you £2,000. And well. Sai said, oh, oh, I'm not paying that. So Madeline worked her magic. She made the woman know Mm. She didn't love him that much. Yeah. Mm. You put a value on it, then it's not. So, there are, <coughs> sometimes there's a reason. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, I was looking online recently when I knew we were going to be talking today, and in 1997 at the PF conference, Doreen Valenti was um, saying something very interesting that she disagreed with Gerard's views on people of the same gender working magically, or gay people working within covens. And she felt, that she felt that was wrong. It was absolutely perfectly fine for people to do that. And I wondered how you felt, and if your attitudes have changed to people of the same gender working together, or whether it matters. My attitude towards any sexuality, doesn't, I don't care. Mm. Um, you, it's said that you can't work um, alone. There's always got to be a female in the circle and there's always got to be a male. Yeah. And I think as long as that is held up, I mean, I love working in a circle with a coffin full of men, mm. gay or whatever, the energy is there and I like yeah. it. Mm. Yeah. So, and, and a lot of people take um, umbrage at, I once said about in the occult world, the disabled would not be admitted, oh, I remember. Yeah. not initiated. Well, I've never worked in a coven without at least three disabled people being in there. Mm. And I have broken the rules. And sometimes it is a real big mistake to initiate somebody fully able-bodied. Right. So yeah. it's, it's horses for courses, somebody comes and asks for initiation. It's whether they have the ability, the vocation and the tendency towards the working mm. of the art magical. Yeah. It's nothing to do about whether they're disabled or not. Or gay. Yeah. Mm. It's their psychological mm. makeup too. Mm. I That's find good. gay men actually have um, they're more sensitive to their power energies. Mm. It's only the occasional heterosexual man. And they they do exist that make brilliant priests. Right. Mm. Don't shout at me for saying that. No, not at all. <laughs> <clears throat> um, another thing that Dorian referred to in, in that same talk, that lecture, was the law of threefold return. She didn't. She she felt that Gerald had made it up, and I wonder whether you held with that uh, belief in karmic, uh, karmic um, law or not. I've got two ways of thinking about this. Um, we we always have a cauldron, always mm. have had, and in this cauldron, that's where the money is kept. Right. And anybody can take from the cauldron. But there's a rule. If you do, you have to return it threefold. Mm. So it teaches them not to be borrowers. Right. To be self-sufficient. Yeah. Um, I think in a lot of cases, the threefold law of return is it's a necessary lesson. Mm. 
I think you can do things with it and use it. As to karmically, well, I don't know. I don't know. If that's the case, I've been very good and very bad in a past life right. because I've had some horrible things happen, but in the main, some really good things. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering how the move to London affected you both. <clears throat> Whether it sort of opened up a whole new range of opportunities of people to meet, or how did, how did that affect you? Um, the London, the, the occult of London came mm. to interrogate us. Who were these, or who was this man yeah. that is spoiling the Sunday newspapers? Um, and Alex was very humble, very kind, mm. always always gave it from his heart um, and some people didn't like him and other people's did and but it happened it it was almost the amount of people i didn't notice it getting bigger right you know to be it was a room our living room was the size of this room perhaps a little bit bigger and it would be full people youngsters you know uh, everybody was going to India for enlightenment, and those that couldn't afford it came to Porti Clanley Guard Gardens. And they'd come and they'd stay. Mm. They would stay, they would, you know, come with the sleeping bags. I remember one group of people, and they were a perfect coven, because there were 13 of them, all young, all from Bournemouth, and they arrived in a great big white Bentley. And um, some of them never went back. Mm. So they stayed. They were right. They were, they were all hippies, peace men, carrying the incense, flowers in the hair, and it was it was a very different time. Mm. Mm. So, I didn't notice it getting so big, and it just happened naturally. Mm. And then, of course, we were we were a Covenstead, and as such, we were open and we attracted people, not by saying, "Oh, you should come and join." but by saying this is what we do. Mm. There was a hunger for it, wasn't there then? Oh. As there still is now, I think. I think the 70s, when... Um, the early 70s, the coven got really big. Mm. Really big. Until about... Until about 1980. Right. And then it tapered off. Mm. And not everybody that works in a coven stays as a working witch. Some of them go on to set their own groups up. Some of them just go on. Yeah. And they stop working the craft. Mm -hmm. in, our, in the Alexandrian tradition, we say at their initiation, you're free to come and go as your conscience dictates. So we put no bound binding on them. Mm -hmm. We don't hold them. Alex had very strong opinions uh, when in Manchester, people would come and they knew that we scourged. Oh, well, the swingers came, the sadomasochists came, and I said, well, and, you know, you're not using my circle. And so he yeah. made silk cords for the scourge. They sit and stopped. <laughs> and um, we, we've got a very dear friend in common talking about the move to London. And when did you first, do you remember your first trip to the Atlantis bookshop meeting Geraldine? Yeah. Geraldine Beskin, for yeah. people who don't know. She, um, uh, that was when we were in Manchester. And it was very new. And it, the dream, the dream was, it, Alex loved here. He loved the museum. Um, but the dream was that Watkins, the British Museum and Atlantis bookshop, it was Museum first, Atlantis second, and Watkins, if we could get the time in. But the very first time, it was foggy. And when you open the door, this creaky old door to get into Atlantis, there was those bookshelves there, and they were the reduced ones. Mm -hmm. And But the, the fog crept under the door, and it was a mist, and it was really magical, intense. Mm -hmm. And it was... Um, it was a magnet. It was a total magnet. But the first time, yes, it was in a three-wheeled little blue car. And I'm not particularly small, but I had to sit in the back all the way from Manchester. It was awful. Mm. <laughs> but yes, that was the first time. Mm. And over the years, I mean, uh, Atlantis Bookshop 
Geraldine Baskin, well, she's like a, a magnet to those who want to know as well. People make their way there before they go to any other, you know, to Govanstead. Mm -hmm. And she's very wise and she guides them. She helps them not to get into trouble, which yeah. is easy. It always has been easy in the, in the occult world to go and find yourself in a very difficult position and find yourself in an abuse, abusive situation. Mm -hmm. So I'm very thankful Geraldine is still there and Atlantis is doing its job. Yeah. And she's so generous and kind with mm -hmm. her time and her knowledge. Mm -hmm. that she's very important. Um, we've got some recordings in the museum of um, Alex's sort of trance work with um, Derek Taylor, psychic. And did you know what they were doing at that time or what that work was about? Because the, the, te the trance tapes are very long and very intense and you can't always hear what's, what's happening. And uh, we've been trying to decipher what was happening for some time. Um, Alex left at the end, left London uh, at the end of 1972. He came back a few times, so it was 73 before he'd really gone and uh, established himself in Bex Hill. Um, but as he was leaving, and I was devastated, absolutely heartbroken, um, I said, why, why? And he said, well, I'm no longer um, of the craft. I now am going to do the great work. Mm. Well, it seems that the great work for a while was wonderful, abandoned sex. Right. Gay sex, lovely. Yeah. Um, to be honest, at the most of the work that was done in Betts Hill, I think it was uh, him paying for his dinner. Mm. Paying for his right. supper and breakfast too. And I think it deteriorated. Mm. I, I think his work was done. And he just came to the end of it. And he got used to being the king of the witches. And he liked it. Mm. He liked it. But he did pay for his supper that way. And Derek Taylor, he eventually, after Alex died, he set up all sorts of things to do with aliens and the like. And um, eventually he went to do a sea ritual and was drowned. Oh. And I have to say, there was an almighty cry of delight from the witches mm. because he was a vicious, cruel man right. who was violent with Alex, very violent. And Alex, well, he, he, Derek would never accept that he was dying. Mm. The witches around him wouldn't accept that he was dying. And um, they should be ashamed of themselves. Mm. But he came back, he came back to London because he knew I, I was always the one that got him out of trouble. Right. If there was a bad press report, he'd bring me up and say, Maxine, get in touch with the press council. Mm. And I would, I'd do it all. And then I'd ring him in the afternoon and somebody would answer the phone and say, oh, he's in the pub. And i think, well, you weren't that concerned. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so can you tell me, moving forward a bit now, can you tell me about the Temple of Mother and um, of the Mother and how and why you set that up? And how it worked. It wasn't a deliberate or conscious act. When Alex left, we abided, most of the witches abided by the rules. And the rules are if, you, if you're going to separate, those who will go with him, go. Mm. You know, so approximately half the coven went with Alex and didn't come to um, my coven. Mm. The co it was just a continuation. I was, um, as I say, devastated and I had a lovely priesthood around me then and they cared and they carried on and one of them rusty in particular took over the training and it evolved it mm. wasn't the temple of the mother it was only a temple of the mother say a year later yeah. and um, it was I think one of the most intensive groups covens mm. ever mm. there wasn't a day without the work happening, circles, hermetics, uh, study, angelic work, um, healing. Every Wednesday was a healing night and the queue would be, it was a queue down the, the steps to the basement and they'd all have to go and sit in the hall and um, we, have, we did get a write up in the Lancet mm. uh, because we were very strict, you know, we always had uh, our witches we had several doctors 
and they were always present. So yeah. the younger priests and priestesses that were learning the art of healing, it, it's easy to make a mistake. Yes. And we, yeah. were, we were really tough mm. on, we wanted the best. If you wanted mm. to be a healer, you had to be good at it. And we didn't want to make any mistakes, these patients that come to see you. And they usually they come to a healer when the doctors have said they can't do any more. Right. And so the witch healer will comfort and heal. Mm. And sometimes that healing is just enabling the person to approach death in the most painless way possible. Right. So, <clears throat> yes, we gathered quite a reputation for ritual. Mm. Even Alex loved it. You know, he would come up because I'm afraid the ritual down at Betzel wasn't that good. Mm. They thought it was, but it wasn't. And of course Alex loved, he was a ritualist at heart. Mm. And what we had done, we had knocked out all the rubbish. Right. Okay. The empty ritual. Mm. There's nothing worse than empty ritual. There's nothing worse than sanctimosity without the holy. And is that still continuing? Uh, no, 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 no. I, um, everything has its heyday, mm. including magical groups. Mm. You can't keep that amount of... I think it went from 73 to nearly 1980, and that was a good few years of absolute intense mm. working, magical working. It wasn't just, oh, we'll meet on a Saturday. It mm. was... Saturday and then there'd be the open ritual on the Sunday and then on the Monday it'd be something else but it was absolutely intense and people were calling all hours of the day and night mm. whether it was the sick, people wanting magic, whether it was a suicide that you'd have to get up and let them in, you know, mm. make them make a cup of tea of course, I'm not going to get up for anybody without a cup of tea. Mm. Um, and also good psychology there. If they were capable of making the tea, there was a strong possibility they weren't going to commit suicide. Mm. Um, yeah, so, so the work, we were... We didn't just work out of self-interest. We were there as... I, I don't want to call it a service, but we were there as a priesthood, mm. and we worked as a priesthood, and we helped people. Mm. So, <clears throat> thinking over, over the years, you must have met so many magical people, apart from Alex, who's touched you the most, do you think? Well, that's a difficult one. It's real magical people. There's some of them, they're, they're wicked, they're mm. evil, but they are magic. Mm. And the percentage in all those that I've met and worked with is about 10% mm. that have that magical core mm. that can turn in a moment into a magical movement mm. um, and cause an effect. So who was the most magical? I don't know. To be honest with you, I couldn't tell you. No. Everybody's an individual and one has to respect another person, whether they're magical or not. Yeah. And when you're a teacher, you don't know whether that person is, the magic can be awakened with them, within them or not. Mm. That's up to them. Mm. But when it has happened, it's been a joy. Mm. Not out of anything holy, no. just that they have that ability to shift their consciousness mm. very quickly and effectively. Mm. And in terms of writers, is there anyone who's I'm not stayed um, with you? I love books, mm. but I dip in. Mm. And but my favourite cult is the unfortunate. Yeah, mm. yeah absolutely. Mm. I think when you read C. Priestess, it gives you the atmosphere of what working magic is about. Mm. Absolutely. There's that, that passage where the, the driftwood's gathered and when it's lit, the different colours that it... And I tried that once. It was, it was, yeah, it was truly magical, that moment. Have you ever wished that you, you didn't have the responsibilities that you have 
being the person you are. I've got responsibilities. Yes, to an extent. I don't think so. No? No. Do you not see them? Well, that's good, I suppose, if you don't see them as responsible. I mean, some people will say, and they're doing this more than ever. I mean, they come up and say, oh, you're the head. And I say, no, I'm not. Mm -hmm. No, I work with my coven, um, and I hope I work well. Mm. And I wish everybody else, their, you know, from their covens. Yeah. Oh, it, when the Grand Sabbaths happen, that's lovely when the covens yeah. come together. And we're, we're holding one soon in, in Portugal, and it's been the work of mm. the Grand Sabbath where the different covens come together. This time it's for healing. Right. And, mm. uh, you know, there are so many rifts and nasty pol political situations in the craft. I think it's time that they started to look at themselves and their craft. We all have to. And say, well, let's heal this. Mm. And then go away, back to our own circles, work our own magic, and let, it, let there be peace, a nice peace, a supportive peace, mm. rather than this joy, absolute joy of viciousness. Mm. Yeah. I think the craft has to start taking, generally, more responsibility for the mother earth. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we, we're constantly going on about, you know, we love, we work with mother nature, we work with the cycles. Well, put your money where your mouth is, get to work. Mm. I mean, even on the level of the amount of sacred sites I've visited and there's stuff left after people have performed rituals that... That's what the, we did in the Temple of the Mother. We'd go to all these sites mm. with our black bags of uh, plastic bags for the rubbish and we'd cleared them we'd we cleared streams rivers mm. planted we were always planting wherever we worked um glastonbury being one of the places alderley edge another regular place glastonbury was difficult it sort of closed its doors to us and we ended up working on a crossroads mm. and so the police couldn't couldn't come and interfere that law still stands but they were they were on the edge of you know, in the background, massive. It was a grand yeah. Sabbath, and um, but they came afterwards. Came was afterwards it? to question us. Yeah, we. Yeah. Mm. Have there any other run-ins with the police while rituals are being performed? Uh, when we lived in um, Salmiston, we used to work on the Wilmington Man, mm. and um, it was very cabalistic. Alex enjoyed cabala and put, bringing it to life. And we were all up on the on the man, and uh, suddenly the, these spotlights, you know, a bit like in America where they're looking for the Joker or something, and you see it, and it they're speaking through their trumpet saying, "Come down, you know, come down, get off." Anyway, we all trooped down, quaking in our boots, well, our nakedness, and um, the policeman he was going through every person saying, "And what's your name?" And he came to one of the witches and, what is your name? He said, my name is Robin Arbuthnot. And the policeman said, oh, go on, pull the other one. He said, Robin said, I shall be pulling things and you will be notified in the morning. Well, he was quite important. Mm. And uh, he did, he got in touch with the Sussex police and the police apologised. Good. And we had permission to work there whenever we want, mm. as long as we notify them first. Right. Mm. I had lots of dealings with the police. Mm. You know, when um, years ago they would come if there'd been a murder or something and they couldn't find the body. We had one particular case where it was a child and that was probably their most horrendous work. They, had, they knew the vicinity but they didn't know where, so we did the work. And the child had been put in one of these storm drains and things. And that was horrible, mm, horrible. And then to be, you know, the next day to say to the police, well, we think we know where the child is. Um, but they would approach us, they would mm. approach us to do, all, you know, discovery or work rather than, um, well, we didn't solve cases or anything. They would tell, tell us specifically what mm. they wanted to know. It's funny though, because cunning folk, the wise woman, would often be asked to find things. It's sort of like a, almost like a traditional thing for um, wise people to practice, mm. the finding of lost objects or stolen property or 
Mm. Not usually. Well, I don't... You, personally, I wouldn't... You know, if you've lost your pen, you've lost your pen. <laughs> um, yeah. It's got to be something really important before I'd even... Uh, and you need, you need a group that is... Um, they're in tune with each other. Mm. And they've done all the practices, you know, of getting out of the body. This, you know, having the safeguard in the circle so as you can bring them back. Yeah. Um, that takes intense trusting yeah, and a ter right. terrific amount of um, patience and kindness to one another because mm. it, it is, it's, um, it's hard work. Mm. Hard work in the way that you're loving the work. It's interesting and you never know, you know, what the outcome's going to be. Mm. And it's dangerous. You know, you get some people that they do. They have one of our witches, Andrew. He was um, he was a computer man, and in those days, with great big computers, you walked through them. And he took an axe to it, had a nervous breakdown. Mm. You know, brilliant mind, mm. thought he could cope with the amount of magic and work. Some mm. people work too hard at it, yeah. and they're not all made for it. Mm. And finally, I think how. Do you see the future of the craft evolving? Have you any thoughts on that? No, none whatsoever. Mm. The craft will look after itself. Self, as is always said, the magic will have its way. The craft mm. is, it, even if it changes and everybody becomes a, a Mars watcher or whatever, and you know Christianity is gone, and it will be said that witchcraft is gone. No, I think witchcraft, even now, is becoming more open and yet more closed. Mm. There's, there are groups there that you don't know about and they work. Mm. They work just as hard as we did in the Temple of the Mother and they're having their heyday. But mm. to keep the magic sacred, you have to keep it secret. Yeah, I agree. Maxine, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Oh, and do carry on being the heartbeat of the craft. We will do, we will do. Promise. <laughs> and thanks for coming down. <laughs>